I think that when people are able to uh, liberate their body of pain and they can find more focus and bring more of their good energy to the circle, you know, at the end of the day, I think the most important thing that yoga offers is community. So take care of yourself and participate in your community. That was Francisco Morales Bermudez, and I'm Henry Winslow. You're listening to Dharma Talk. Dharma Talkers, what is going on? Welcome to the show. I'm thrilled you're here because I've got another inspiring conversation to share with you from an especially thoughtful, interesting, and humble man this week. But first, are you working on advancing your practice? Check out the Henry Yoga app. It's my mobile optimized and intuitively designed app-based program of Hatha Vinyasa classes and asana workshops to level up your practice from home. Go get the first two classes totally free at henryyoga.com and see what the fuss is about. All right, what is it about yoga that makes all of the drama, the rush, the hustle of modern life feel a little bit easier? Like if you live in a metropolis like New York City and you're stressed out, just grinding day in, day out, why is it that doing a yoga practice seems to alleviate some of that heavy weight on your shoulders? I've got my theories. Maybe it's a temporary distraction, a healthy one, or maybe connecting deeply with ourselves helps to even out the highs and lows because when we go inside and explore, the inner world feels more real and more important than the outer world. Well, my guest on this week's episode, Francisco Morales Bermudez, lives in Peru. And what he says is living amongst nature and in reverence to nature in the way that Peruvians do is kind of like that post-yoga feeling but all day long. Sounds pretty good, right? You're going to want to listen all the way through this episode, no doubt, because Francisco has a lot to share. Years ago, he and his friends in San Francisco invented acro yoga, no big deal. And now when he isn't guiding visitors through his motherland or doing nonprofit work in Peru, Francisco tours the world sharing the practices of yoga and Thai massage as methods of healing. All that and more coming right up. Let's take a beat to thank our sponsors. This episode is brought to you in part by Yoga East Austin. This March, I'm super excited to partake in a second round of rocket yoga training at Yoga East Austin with the worldly rocket yogi himself, David Kyle. It's a five-day RYT, 50-hour practice intensive with the Rocket Yoga Pioneer and someone I consider a friend and a teacher. Last year's 50-hour intensive was epic, bringing together over 50 yogis from all over the world to learn about the Rocket Yoga Vinyasa system from David himself. David and I immediately connected. Since then, he's been a Dharma Talk guest. Check out episode 61. And I have visited Puerto Rico to practice with him and teach workshops at his school, Ashtanga Yoga, Puerto Rico. David is a student of the late Rocket Yoga founder, Larry Schultz, who studied Ashtanga extensively in Mysore in the 60s and 70s. If you're curious about Ashtanga or enjoy getting upside down, this training makes a great introduction, especially since the Rocket style tends to be a bit more loose and playful than traditional Ashtanga. In Rocket, you get to try postures from the second and third series and experiment with fun, accessible, and creative sequencing. I thoroughly enjoyed this experience last year, and I'm pumped to dive in for another 50 hours in my old stomping grounds, Yoga East Austin, this spring from March 23rd to 27th. Be sure to act now. This intensive is about 70% full and will sell out. For more info, go to yogaeastaustin.com slash events. This episode is brought to you in part by Warrior Bridge NYC. Warrior Bridge is an interdisciplinary movement studio in downtown Manhattan, offering classes in yoga, acro yoga, handstands, and flexibility training. Their classes are skillfully designed, featuring anatomy-informed warm-ups and progressions, drawing from and blending different yoga and movement modalities. 
While the offerings are diverse, what's constant is an emphasis on practicing in a way that honors where you're coming from and where you're trying to go. Warrior Bridge offers a full schedule of weekly classes, weekend workshops with visiting instructors, and teacher training programs, the next wave of which will be held this summer in NYC. First up, anatomy and movement teacher training from July 15th to 25th, led by Sean Langhouse and Emily Lazinski. Sean was a past guest on Dharma Talk, of course. This training is designed for both practicing and aspiring teachers who want to better understand anatomy and how the body works, as well as Warrior Bridge's unique training methodology around yoga, handstand, flexibility training, prehab, and injury prevention. And the next training will be their Acro Warrior Teacher Training from July 27th to August 6th. This is New York City's only Acro Yoga Teacher Training and is all about immersing yourself in the Acro practice and acquiring the skills to safely and intelligently lead Acro Yoga classes and practice. Learn more and register at warriorbridge.com. Now back to the show. Francisco Morales Bermudez at francisco.mba on Instagram, is the founder of Synergy Yoga. After an athletic childhood that culminated in a wrestling scholarship to university, Francisco broke his spine at 18 and then turned his focus to healing modalities. He and a small team of roommates developed a new style of partner movement that would come to be known as Acro Yoga, and now he resides in Peru, where he brings groups on retreats centered around yoga, nature, and Native American philosophy. He loves getting upside down, and he leads Thai massage certifications to assist people to remove pain from their bodies. Francisco travels the world sharing yoga, leading Thai massage programs, and running Synergy Yoga with a talented team of nine facilitators who specialize in a diverse range of healing modalities. If you'd like to go deeper with Francisco, go to dharmatalk.show and type Francisco in the search bar. And there you will find all the notes, highlights with timestamps and links for this episode. And as always, if you're looking for something to read, check out Francisco's recommended book. I've got a running list of every book ever recommended on Dharma Talk, which you can find at henrywins.com slash books. So go there and pick one out. Now, without further ado, please enjoy my interview with Francisco Morales Bermudez. Francisco, welcome to Dharma Talk. We've had this podcast on our plans for a long time now. I'm really excited that we're making it happen from different corners of the world. How are you today? I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, we've been talking about this since I took your class over at Jared's at Lighthouse in Brooklyn about a year ago. I'm good. I'm in Peru. Uh, good to be home down here. Um, and good to be having this conversation with you finally. How's it going? How long has, uh, it's, it's going, it's going well for me. I'm sort of in a moment of transition. I'm in California, but without a permanent base. So I can totally see what you mean by feeling good about being home. That's something that I've, I've missed (laughs) for a little while now. I'm looking forward to having another one of those soon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yogis, we tend to be a lot of very, very nomadic, you know, so getting that space to ground out, um, is really healthy. Totally. Yeah. I miss it. I'm, I'm ready for it, but let's, uh, let's talk about you instead of me for now. What is, right. yeah, let's, let's start with the first question. I give this question to everyone. What does the word Dharma mean to you? And what is your Dharma as you understand it today? Um, cosmic order as far as, you know, what it means to me. Um, and as far as like my Dharma, I feel like I'm kind of redefining it every day. Um, you know, I have a lot of things that I'm working on in my life, um, to find balance and, um, you know, when I first was introduced to the word Dharma, it was uh, when I went and took Dharma Mitra's teacher training <laughs> and I had no studied to the, to the word. Uh, I thought Dharma was just a, a name of a person. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and, you know, then it kind of shifted and, and I later perceived it to be like your, your duty in life, you know, like um, what you want to offer to the world and, 
Dharma used to always focus on the asanas as offerings. Um, so even down to, to your postures <laughs> where your Dharma, um, but the more I kind of give thought to the word, um, you know, prior to this conversation, that's like the only questions, you know, that's the only prepared part of this podcast, uh, conversation. So when you send it to me, it's, it got me thinking about cosmic order, um, and just how, you know, everyone's living their Dharma. Cosmic order and how everyone is living their Dharma. So by that, do you mean that because of the order of the universe and how everything works together, necessarily everyone is living their Dharma? Yes. And, you know, sometimes we're engaged in things that we're not, we don't, we're not content with, or, you know, we, we find there's a lot of like, you know, judgment to these different things taking place or even of ourselves, but, you know, things always kind of circling around and like spiraling around and, and realizing the, the purpose of all the, all the things that we're putting out, you know, become more clear. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with you on that. It's, it, I think as much as we try and, and we are striving toward living in alignment with our purpose and our duty and, and being of service, making those offerings that are meaningful to other people, there's no real way to be fully out of alignment. It's just that sometimes being in alignment at that specific moment feels very uncomfortable and there's a lesson there, but ultimately we're headed in the right direction because there's no other way. Exactly, man. And, and it's really easy to get like really high or really low emotionally about certain circumstances. Um, you know, even I think relationships is probably like one of the most, uh, close things to people. Um, but then, you know, later on with time, we start to see even the purpose of, of the highs and the lows. And then I, I think over time we start to not get too high or, or too low. <laughs> um, ideally, I think kind of yoga assists us in that, you know, um, not getting too high or too low from different life circumstances. Right. It's like yoga is leading us toward stoicism essentially. I mean, I think all of these philosophies of the various cultures of the world, the various lineages, like there's a universal truth that everybody is working toward and that's to be sort of more unflappable and <laughs> to yeah. be able to rest in that peace, rest in composure, no matter what uncertainties and, um, and obstacles life throws at you. And yoga definitely is a practice that helps you get there. I would agree with that. Yeah. Unflappable. I like that. So you, you did yoga teacher training with Dharma Mitra, but I know that your background in yoga is not just exclusive to that. You're, you've explored a lot of different, uh, paths on the broad arena that is yoga. And ultimately you've also created forms of yoga and practice that you teach and train others on. Can you take us through a bit of a personal history of how you were exposed to yoga at first and how you moved through your Dharma, through your path to what you're teaching now? Sure. Um, so the first class I, uh, the yoga class I ever took, um, my girlfriend, my freshman year of college, my girlfriend took me to class and, and, uh, I fell asleep in the class. Um, and <laughs> I don't remember much of it. It was like a really good nap. And so I always associate it with like a tranquil, very peaceful, relaxing environment. Um, and then later on, uh, so I immigrated to the States, uh, mostly cause my mom was ill and she had been interned in a hospital in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. And because she couldn't get treat, she couldn't get treatment in Peru. Um, and the Western meds, uh, had kind of took a toll on her, uh, emotionally and she kind of wasn't herself. And then I saw her kind of becoming just more of who I remember my mom to be and just a really vibrant, you know, playful, life loving person. Um, and I was like, what have you been doing? <laughs> you know, like I was still pretty young. Um, and she's like, I've been going to yoga. I was like, oh, wow. So I was like, keep it up, mom, you know, and she had been taking class from this uh, Peruvian 
astrologer that had an ashram in Maryland. And he would, um, his name is Victor Landa and the Shanti Yoga Ashram for uh, Peace and Harmony is the space. And it was a really revolutionary center. And so later on, you know, like fast forward like a year, she asked me what, I asked her what she wanted for her birthday and she's like, come to yoga with me. And I was like, that's it? I was like, she's like, yeah. I was like, great, I'll do that. So we went to yoga and um, he would um, do yoga class and then he would invite a speaker uh, and they had uh, like a farm. So they would make food from the farm at the ashram and we would sit down and have lunch and have a speaker and he would invite like the leader of the Zapatistas <laughs> to talk, you know, because uh, it was so the Zapatistas is a, is a revolutionary movement from the indigenous tribes of Mexico. Uh, and it's very rare to go to a yoga ashram and get a leader of a revolutionary Mexican indigenous tribe as a speaker. <laughs> yeah. You don't say. I, I haven't yeah. had one of those yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> pretty unique. And, and I mean, Victor was a really unique man. And I think because his ashram was right outside of DC, which is just a really political environment, um, he would have like different, you know, political leaders and people who are like, you know, coming to Washington, it's like the, you know, DC is like the capital of nonprofits and the capital of politics, you know, of, of America at least, um, and North America. And, you know, it was, so it was, it left a profound impression on me and I bought a book and it was the, uh, Shivananda's beginning yoga guide was, was the book, uh, which is a really great book. Cause it gives you like short synopsis on like, uh, food, uh, philosophy, history, and asana, you know? Um, and I would just take the book and do like three postures a day, um, at home. And, and that was my introduction, uh, to, to yoga. Um, and, you know, it was a really healthy environment. I would go there and I did a training with Victor. And when I was getting ready to go to like a little bit later, I started practicing uh, Bikram yoga more because I was doing nonprofit work uh, running. I ran a national education program for a nonprofit conservation association. And I was traveling to San Francisco to meet with the young people that I was working with. And I basically was in my hotel room and I had to travel back to the East coast and, you know, five hour flight. I was like, let me try to stretch out my body before I hop in the airplane. And I opened up the phone book. So that kind of gives you a little gauge of the, the period of time, um, <laughs> that that was in. And I opened up the phone book and found the closest yoga studio to the hotel I was in. And it happened to be, uh, the funky door on Polk and Pine street. And that was, uh, like a hot yoga Vikram studio. And, you know, I had, I did the practice and, you know, three showers later, I was still sweating. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember back then my sister was sick and, and they had the doctors at the same hospital my mom was in told her she had three months to live. Um, so my sister and I are really tight. We're like a year and a half difference. So it made a big impact on me emotionally, but I hadn't been able to express my emotions because I kind of had it hold it down for my mom and my sister emotionally. I had to be the, the dude, you know, in the house and, and just take care of my girls. And I remember like being in my hotel room and like I was saying three showers later, like still sweating and I started crying all of a sudden and I hadn't been able to cry in a really long time. So while as I was shedding tears, I realized that I was letting go of emotions that didn't serve me and the things that I had been holding on to during my sister's, uh, you know, um, medical prognosis, uh, I think is the term. Um, and 
so the minute I got back to the East Coast, um, I kind of searched out hot yoga and started practicing a little bit more of that. And yeah, what, what else is in there that I can release? Pardon? Yeah, exactly. Like, Basically, like, know, what's, what else is in there that I can release? Yeah, and this is a lot. And, and I started to even be... More, just more thoughtful that that yoga is a lot more than than a physical you know practice it's gonna heal my knee <laughs> you know uh there's there's more to it than that there's a lot related to the emotional body and you know it's a really like complete in my like a really thorough practice um and I wanted to keep it up. And, you know, I had my trauma in my body from like, my body went through the windshield. Of, like I broke the windshield of a car with my body in a car accident. So I broke my spine. Um, and I've always been a really physical person. Um, I express creativity through the body quite often. And so much so that my, my first job when I landed in the States was dancing with my sister at a, at a Peruvian restaurant. <laughs> so we've always been like dancing or, you know, I got really deep into capoeira, like a Afro Brazilian martial art. Um, and all of a sudden after that spine injury, the movement was taken away from me. So I started to get more creative in how to open up my body again, like even hanging on a pull-up bar. I would get gravity boots and hang upside down uh, to kind of create space in my spine. And this is all before yoga practice. Um, okay, I was just about to ask. Okay, so this is all information and uh, an experience from before the first Shivananda yoga class. Exactly, exactly. Okay, okay. And so I used to, the ocean, I used to swim a lot, just use the ocean spine undulations um, in the water, you know, like when you're doing the butterfly stroke, um, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm from the coast of Peru. So I grew up a lot like, you know, surfing and fishing and just, so the ocean was a good, uh, kind of environment for me to heal, uh, and hanging on pull-up bars. Like I just started to get really creative and how to, you know, create space in, in, the areas that had been traumatized in my spine rather than getting spinal fusion, uh, surgery. Um, and that's when I got deep into also Thai massage and body work. Um, but when I started to practice yoga, I found the healing, uh, a lot more impactful, you know? Um, but I also realized that the healing, was not just physical. It was, you know, letting go of all the, the emotional stuff that you're holding on to. Um, and the example I gave you of my sister was a pretty profound, you know, example and experience. Mm -hmm. And had, was that the first wake up call that, that yoga was working as a therapy beyond your spine and your physicality, or had you already experienced that before? Um, I experienced, uh, you know, I, I experienced like, uh, before that with, remember, I, like when I was doing the three postures a day, I, I would hold them for quite a bit. <laughs> um, and I found a lot of healing in the areas of my spine with the postures. That's why I was still, that's why I kept them up, you know? Um, and I would do them those like three postures a day, every day, basically in the evenings, um, after like my whole day of work and stuff. Um, and I found a lot of healing in those vertebras, uh, holding like a, a, a back bend and just surrendering to breath. And I noticed my breath because it was so tight in those areas that I felt my struggle of breath. And I think because there's not that much stimulation in yoga asana, it, it's kind of like, you know, in the ocean when I'm swimming, like I just swam around, um, the pier today, you know, I'm swimming by a fisherman's net or their boats or the lighthouse, you know? So there's all this stimulation. It's not bad stimulation, but in yoga asana, it's like, it, it's, um, it makes it obvious that 
you're, it makes it obvious and a little bit more easier to focus on your breath, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And the surrendering of breath becomes very medicinal. So once I was able to feel that, which was pretty, pretty right away, I had a good teacher, you know, um, and, uh, and I was really open to the teacher, <laughs> which made it easier. Uh, and when I was able to surrender to breath, I felt little subtle release in those areas in the spine and. Uh, but I didn't feel that big emotional upheaval <laughs> like I did. I see. You know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you come, you come at yoga with this history of uh, physical trauma and something really compels you to keep going with it. You're starting to feel some relief in your spine, your body's feeling better. And then you had this profound moment of emotional release and recognize that yoga is something it's working on deeper levels than simply the physiology and physicality. Where does, um, the, the Thai yoga massage enter the picture for you? Um, I, when my mom first became ill, I, you know, I think as a kid, the, the, a lot of massage, even like the flying stuff, it's like innate to, to love and being able to take care of your loved ones. Um, and I, you know, I, I, when my mom was sick, we would have a massage therapist come to the house and I would watch the techniques and I got really entranced by the, the modalities of, of body work and just also how good my family members felt after. So this is like when I was like six, I got, I really geeked out into that. And I was living at my grandparents' home at the time and like an old barrio in Lima and in La Victoria is the name of that area. And next to their house was a Japanese, uh, so Peruvian culture is very like celebratory of like the immigrants that have come through here so much so that there's like Peruvian Chinese food restaurants in the States, <laughs> you know, um, you should check it out the next time you're in New York, actually. Yeah, that um, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, but there was a Japanese, uh, body work school next to my grandparents' house. And I would just always go watch the techniques. And then when I moved to the States and I kind of had a chance to d make a decision on what I wanted to do professionally, I really kind of wanted to hone in on massage. So I went to get the state certification, uh, program, uh, cause as a massage therapist in the United States, like all the States are like little mini governments. Uh, and they, you know, you have to get certified by each state. And if you go to another state, you got to like redo your certification. Right. Um, yeah. so I was a lot of, do, living a lot in, of barriers. Yeah. 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 It's, um, you know, it's a way for the local government to get a tariff in a way. Um, you know, luckily yoga hasn't gone that route yet. Uh, hopefully it never will, you know? Um, but massage had that element. So I went to go get certified and in the process of getting certified, they told me that you couldn't massage the abdomen and the glutes. And I was like, really the abdomen, like all our organs are in there. <laughs> like, you know, that's kind of valuable. Yeah. 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 And and the, the glutes, like that's the, the iliac crest and the, the gluteus minimus, maximus medius, like they pull on that pelvic girdle. Like I was like, what? Uh, so I, I got my certification, but then I, be, I also was like, I wanted to learn, like to me, it's like in my, in my mind, I had more of a romantic view of bodywork, like that had more history and philosophy, you know? And I started to read about Thai massage and it's interweaving with yoga um, like historically. Uh, and I started to study like different, you know, Thai body workers. And I saw that, um, the, at the Wapo temple in Bangkok, they had hired my, like, um, this man, Cam Tai Chow, which was soon to be my teacher to redraw the energy lines that had eroded off the temple walls. And I was like, wow, if the monks are hiring this guy, I want to go study with him. Um, so I went and studied with Cam Tai and, and that's, you know, that's what kind of like brought that wave of, of Thai massage, uh, to my life. And I've been doing it ever since. And, mm -hmm. uh, he passed two years ago. 
Uh, so until then I was just doing workshops and massages like one-on-one. And since he passed, I've been doing kind of trying to carry on his work and, and do now I've been doing time massage certifications. Yeah. I, I sense that you have this deep reverence for the history and cultural background behind the things that you're sharing and teaching. How are you, how are you weaving respect and integrity of these cultures into your offerings, be it the native South American Peruvian influences or the Thai influences? And how do you reconcile bringing these different cultural facets together? Um, well, so each, I think in a way, um, a lot of these like traditional, um, native practices communicate a very similar essence, um, with each one, with each modality, even with the retreats that I lead to Peru, um, you know, they're what I'm trying to bring. It's, you know, it's a little bit different in how they're expressed, you know, um, and let me know if I'm answering your question on point um, or not. Okay. I uh, just want to make sure I got you. But sure. uh, so Cam Thai really communicated the essence of Metta and Karuna meditation. Um, so in all the programs I lead for like the time massage certifications, they're, you know, each, and he also emphasized that you have to make it your own meditation. You know, so the, and let me take a step back for that to explain it to people that are just kind of opening up to time massage for the first time. Uh, so Karuna means it, it's uh, like, if you go to a Buddhist temple, you see this Bodhisattva statue with hundreds of hands. Each of those hands has a different word for the word love. Okay. So they actually had hundreds of words love, (laughs) um, that had a different unique way of loving. Right. So Kaduna means to actually physically remove someone's pain, uh, with your hands and Titna Han's example, uh, this really fantastic, uh, Buddhist monk, uh, his example is like when someone steps on a thorn and you take the thorn out and you put some balm on it, that's like his, his example. Thai massage is a practice of Kaduna meditation and meta meditation, which is loving kindness. So in meditation, there's no one cookie cutter way to do it. So in essence, I teach people the techniques and the rhythms to kind of maintain the traditions. Um, and then I emphasize people over time, finding their own meditation with these different techniques. Um, so with Thai massage, that's how I'm, you know, kind of yearning to celebrate, you know, the, the tradition of it. And then I also like when I do programs, I, um, and I'm always doing research myself, you know, I mean, part of the reason, like, it's like, I'm continuously, like I'm going to Thailand next year again. Uh, and then with Peru for, for me, uh, Peruvian, uh, kind of traditions, are I think even more vibrant today. There's so many people flying to Peru. Uh, I think it's kind of like a, a destination spot for a lot of people seeking like spiritual healing. Um, and so in Peru, the emphasis is the Pachamama, which is the mother earth. Um, the, so in Peru, the emphasis of the Peruvian culture is like the respect to the earth. The, the trilogy per se is the three sacred mountains. The mountains are sacred because they bring, because these big peaks have the late, the glacial streams that give you water and water means gives you life. Um, and the Pachamama is, it's, you know, it's the other, the mother earth, the mama coach is the mother ocean. So I think as we've gotten kind of very cerebral in our culture, uh, a little bit, we've left some of these, what are perceived to be simple, uh, elementary thoughts. Uh, but the most simple is, is, and is the, the sweetest and the most powerful. Like if you, you know, I've, I've, 
I bit had the pleasure to, to kind of like be like a mediator and bring people from the Americas and Europe to Peru uh, for the first time. It's been really beautiful just to be of service in that, in that manner and to watch people be awed by the native communities connection to the earth and respect for the earth. Um, you know, yeah. What does that look like? Like paint a picture because it's one thing to talk about how there's so much beauty and profundity in connecting to earth. But when we live in this, you know, North American or European lifestyle where we're rushing from task to task and doing our jobs and maybe, you know, fulfilling our familial obligations. And it, it just doesn't seem like something that we could rationally fit into our lives. So what does it look like for someone who has truly embraced Pachamama well, and mother earth? Yeah. Well, I mean, in a way, day? I think that even people that are amidst the hustle, it's, you know, they're, when they go to yoga, they're, they're finding that, that ease, you know? Um, so to me, it's, it's that ease, but it's kind of like all day, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> nice. Sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and I think, and sometimes I think our, our culture can get a little judgmental, like, you know, um, like a little bit guilt oriented, like we're not doing good up here down there. They're doing really good connection to the earth. I think everyone's doing great. You know, as far as like the yoga community that I move in, I'm in constant awe. Everyone has a really unique awe and offering to the circle and the Peruvian culture to me, their eye offering is this consistent flow with like the rhythm of, of the earth. Like, like if, if they're walking and they're, they're doing their, the, you know, even the, the plowing of, of, of a farmer's land is, is very old and traditional. They, they have maintained them away from the machines. Uh, so if you're working on your land and you feel a breeze, you see every farmer stop and just close their eyes and feel the breeze hit their face, you know? Um, and which if you come out of yoga class and you feel a breeze, you probably will do the same. <laughs> yeah. You do <laughs> <sometimes>. that too. <laughs> you know? Um, but if you're coming out of your office, you might not, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, right. so, you know, it's been interesting to see that down there and, also the GMOs were vetoed in the Peruvian farming about 14 years ago. Uh, every farmer, when the Peruvian government, cause there's a lot of money to be made, uh, through the GMOs, uh, when the Peruvian government was about to, was debating accepting this into the, into the earth down here, uh, every farmer in the country went on strike. So that I think would communicate really powerfully how much, you know, just every farmer, imagine if every farmer in the country in the United States went on strike, you know? Um, Yeah. It it speaks volumes to like the collective universal values of the culture that there's without exception, just universal agreement that that's not okay. We're not doing that. Yeah. Exactly. And, and I mean, and just to brag about, about the richness of, of this earth, it's like, so Peru has the largest, um, kind of variety of microclimates in the planet in one country. Uh, it also has the largest, not just like throughout the different environments, like the, the jungle, the Andes, the coast, you know, but also the largest variety of microclimates in the ocean. So in the Northern ocean, it has the largest variety of like So there's different levels of protection, uh, one to five and the Northern coast of Peru is close to that level because it's near the Galapagos, which is the most concentrated protection space. Um, so when you're swimming in the ocean, you feel it's, it's richness and it's medicine. Um, what do you mean by protection space in the ocean? So, uh, there's a governing board, like a global governing board kind of ocean protection, um, organization that works with NOAA. Um, and they do 
like maintain like oil rigs and stuff like that, like out of, um, the area. Um, and so when so much so that it's like when the, 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 I think it's called the national oceanic and atmospheric, uh, group administration. Um, so they're them and a couple of nonprofits work with like different regional and local governments, uh, to maintain certain ocean bodies protected. So you can't cruise ships can't go through there. You know, uh, I know like in the kind of Quintana Roo, like the Cancun, like Tulum Caribbean area, uh, there's a lot of cruise ships, um, that move in that area. So that is the second largest coral reef that has gotten infected. So there's like, like seaweed epidemic that kind of gets, uh, infested, um, so those beaches are starting to kind of like pay the toll, you know, for that. Um, and so the level of pr- ocean protection in certain areas is, is, uh, permits commercial, um, cruise ships and boats to dump the, uh, the you know, their, <laughs> their stuff <laughs> oh, wow. into the water, <laughs> into the water. Uh, but in the Northern coast of Peru, they're forbidden from even moving through that, that terrain. Not only can right. they not dump, but they can't cruise through there. Because you know? they're going to be uh, downstream ecological effects from them carrying over like invasive species and whatnot. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, and all the oceans are connected. So it's like all the tides are moving, you know, so it's like they're all connected, but uh, more, like specifically like focus this area, like you can't, um, you know, cruise ships can't dump anything, nor can they move through there. Uh, and oil rigs are not permitted in, in certain regions, you know? Mm. Um, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. You're, you're making a strong, compelling case for why we should all visit Peru, but perhaps (laughs) not in droves. We got to do it carefully. We have to tread lightly. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, so apart yeah, from, I hope you can make it down here one day for sure. Uh, apart from showing people the, the vast beauty and diversity of Peru on these retreats, what else, what else do you do down there? Um, I started, a uh, uh, yoga, yoga and ocean conservation festival called yoga mar. Um, and with my buddy, with two partners, a friend of mine who's Swiss and his wife, uh, who is Peruvian, uh, Christian and, and Xenia. Uh, so we started a ocean conservation festival called Yoga Mar that do, does music and yoga arts and in the Northern coast and promotes sustainable tourism. Uh, cause a lot of these coastal, these, you know, these beaches, kind of tourism is inevitable. Uh, so the intention is to kind of teach the local businesses about, you know, how to do, uh, social eco tourism in the area. Um, and we've also put together, we're putting like a kit, uh, so to put together different yoga mar festivals and different beaches throughout, uh, you know, kind of iconic beach areas throughout the world. Um, so I do some nonprofit work. Um, Yoga Mar is a program of a nonprofit that I run with uh, my friends. And we've also done work in the Andes to preserve the folk stories and traditions, uh, funded a couple of schools and, you know, hired like theater teachers to go to the schools and yoga teachers, uh, to go to the schools to teach yoga as a PE curriculum. Um, and then teach theater as a way to preserve the folk stories and traditions. Cause a culture that loses its folk stories kind of gets, um, depleted of its energy. Um, Mm -hmm. that's similar to what happened like in the United States with, you know, when, when a lot of these powerful tribes were ordained into reservations, um, and kind of forced to do a different education pattern. Um, Mm. so we're trying to maintain those stories 
So, and it's, it's really cool what's happened, man. Like a couple of the programs, the kids that I worked with, um, they, they put together their folk story, uh, theater performance and they got invited to Lima to the big capital. So they came from the mountains in a very high Andean region and they came down to the big city and they saw the ocean for the first time. Um, and then they won the festival there and then they went to Europe, <laughs> which is pretty far out because these kids are, you know, they're from a very isolated mountain town. And then all of a sudden they were, you know, sharing their folk stories in, in I think it was in Holland, the, the, the festival that they got invited to. But so right now we run some nonprofits. One preserving this, and there are, we have different. The pro, nonprofit has different programs. One of them being the Yoga Mar and doing more like uh, environmental education programs uh, and environmental studies in partnership with some of the uh, Peruvian universities. And then um, in the mountains, doing fo- like preservation of the local traditions. Very cool. That. Um- I actually, when I asked the question, really what I was asking about was what else happens on the retreats, but I'm glad you took the, you interpreted the question the way you did. That was a really worthwhile, um, diversion. Uh, but now I will ask a more pointed question. Yes. What is synergy yoga? Cause I know that that is part of the retreats and this to me feels like a culmination of all of the different interests and passions and, and backgrounds that have been a factor in your life yeah um you're saying like synergy yoga is like a culmination um maybe i shouldn't project that um but that's my sense from the outside but tell me about it yeah no a hundred um so like to answer your first question like what happens in the retreats it's like when any generally when people come to peru for the first time um they associate peru with machu picchu um, you know, one of the wonders and it's very wonderful. Um, so nowadays too, there's a lot of tourism for like native plant medicine. Um, and so on, on a retreat, what my, you know, it's like, I've been doing these retreats once a year since 2005 or so, and now I'm doing them twice a year. And, you know, Every year it's I've, I've been kind of just fine tuning my craft and the offering of the retreats to just continuously make it better and work with more people like my friend Melinda, who owns the Yoga Mandala uh, Hotel in, um, in the Sacred Valley. And the schedule of the retreat consists of yoga every day, uh, also introducing the people who are coming to the native arts. And so they'll even participate in some, uh, workshops and be introduced to very amazing artists from this country. Uh, I like using art as a medium for people to understand a culture. Um, so we meet with one of the most famous, uh, painters from Peru and famous uh and uh seminario very f- amazing ceramic artist who started a school um in the urubamba sacred valley to preserve the traditional ceramic art of the country and he also has a permanent exhibit at the chicago museum and he's a super humble sweet guy like he just did an ex- exhibit at the met and you know Oh, you know, he's going to all these like very profound places to demonstrate his art. And he's still the same old hippies he's been for a long time, you know? Um, so we are introduced to the culture through art and we visit very iconic sacred sites of the Andean people. Um, and then we eat really good food (laughs) and we stay in a very awesome hotel, the Young Mandala Hotel. Does that answer that question? Yeah, it sounds, sounds beautiful. And I, I completely understand and respect your philosophy around experiencing the culture through the art. It's a, it's a powerful way to do so, a powerful window into the psyche of a people. 
Yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And then as far as synergy goes, um, so now it's kind of evolved. Um, it's, I started teaching, I called it synergy partner yoga. Um, and me and a couple of friends, one of them, my roommate, when I had lived in San Francisco, I had like a rent control apartment in Knob Hill. It was like $300 a month. Um, which is really rare if you That's know San Francisco. Unreal, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unreal totally. in San Francisco. Yeah, and we because we had such good rent, <laughs> we were we had time to kind of get creative and explore more arts that we were into. Um, so we we started to. He was an acrobat. A friend was a circus performer, and I was like more bringing yoga and Thai massage to the collaboration. Uh, we started a practice called Acro Yoga. And because it was in the Bay Area, which is like where the 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 center of uh, Yoga Journal, uh, like the offices of Yoga Journal in that area. So I think it's like if you were teaching yoga at that time, you know, and you were really into it, most likely it was going to take off because like Yoga Journal was going to probably put it on their magazine because it was just in the area. <laughs> um and Yoga Journal sponsored us. We did, and it kind of grew Acro Yoga. And when I spun out of Acro Yoga, I started teaching Synergy Partner Yoga, like really focusing on the therapeutic element of partner stretching and using partner stretching to make space in the body um, and to liberate the body from pain um, so that athletes and yogis could kind of like work the kinks out so that they could be, you know, it'll give them like a tool for their practice. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It um, sounds like a natural extension of the Karuna meditation. Yes, exactly. Um, and the name synergy, it just started cause I, I was teaching at a yoga training in Hawaii years ago and my buddy Khalil was taking the training and Khalil Gibram was one of my favorite authors, uh, when I was growing up. So, I was like, let me ask Khalil <laughs> what I should name this. And he's like, Synergy. I was like, that sounds great. Um, but that goes back to like, sometimes you come up, you do you, a certain choice is made. It's not your choice, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And later on, you realize why, you know? Uh, nowadays, Synergy Yoga consists of a team of pretty awesome people, uh, like just really people that have put a lot of time and years and love into their practice. My friend Melinda runs a synergy wellness program and she's does a lot of like plant medicine and kind of like people go down to her hotel to liberate themselves from just toxic energy emotionally and physically. She puts people through cleanses. Um, pretty, pretty powerful. I've been able to witness and she also owns a, a hotel where I host my retreats. Um, so she runs the wellness program and my friend Salim, he runs the synergy flow, which is a vinyasa teacher training. And he's, I'd known him like 20 years back from like the late nineties when we were playing Capoeira in Brooklyn, uh, at prospect park and, you know, just young punks getting down and, and just a really good brother. Uh, he runs a nonprofit called Capoeira Kibera as well in, um, in Kibera, which is the largest slum in Africa and teaching young people capoeira and just, uh, capoeira Angola. And he runs the flow program. My friend Salo in Peru who runs the movement. Uh, but yeah, you should check out the website synergy.yoga. And if you go to the team section, you'll see like my friend Margie running the synergy kids program. Uh, she's based in, uh, the Philadelphia area at the moment. Uh, and she used to be a Philadelphia Eagles cheerleader back in the day. Like she's just like, just a really powerful woman, but just surrounded myself by very, just very dynamic heart led and very wise people. And we've put together a team. We're getting together in July in Oregon. Actually, we're renting a, a house in Oregon in July and Synergy Yoga today offers like a variety of programs from Thai massage to kids yoga trainings and vinyasa. Yeah. 
you really grew into the name. I see what you mean now. I wasn't sure where you were going with that, but yeah, when you, when you took on the name, it perhaps didn't have the, the deep, rich, enriched meaning that it does now working with all these people and, um, putting your trust in, in others to help build the mission that you've all collectively agreed on. So that's, that's a beautiful idea and it's definitely inspiring for me. Yeah, it's been, it's been awesome, man, just to be around people that, you know, you can learn from. And it's like, it's, it's never, I, I really kind of tread lightly with like, you know, just, I want to, you know, just making it about when we started teaching Synergy Partner Yoga, it's like all Synergy Partner Yoga practices, we start in a circle and we finish in a circle. And it's never about the one person, it's about the circle. Mm-hmm. And, and I think now it's like we have a circle of pretty awesome people and yeah. So we got to keep moving together and give each other feedback for our programs that everyone's kind of, kind of running, you know, like I do a lot of the time massage stuff with my friend Miriam and in the level two, we have like an Ayurveda component that my friend Nicole, um, who has that studio in Blacksburg actually that I told you about, mm-hmm. uh, she does the Ayurveda component to the level two. Yeah. It's a good way to go through life, you know, learning from each other, always challenging yourself, even when you are technically in the position of being the leader. It's like that shouldn't stop you from growing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, man. And it's, and it's a lot more fun when you're sitting in a circle with a bunch of other people. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah, a lot um, more enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. And you can make that your work, you know? Yeah. Cool. Well, I think this is a good time to start wrapping things up. Let's, let's finish off with the prana round. I, I always end the interviews with this. It's a sequence of six rapid fire questions. So don't think too hard. Just let the first answer that comes to your mind, come out minimum one word, maximum one sentence. All right, Francisco. Gotcha. Okay. First question in one word. Why do you practice yoga? Love. What is your favorite yoga pose and why? So awesome. Um, it's, it's the contemplation. What is the single best cue or piece of advice that you've ever received from a yoga teacher? Make your asana an offering from Dharma Mitra. From Dharma Mitra. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Recommend one book, modern or ancient, for our audience. Uh, of so many. So I'm just going to say the one that I've been getting into most recently. It's called Saltwater Buddha. And the author lives in the Bay Area. His name is Jamal Yogis. Saltwater Buddha. Okay. Is yoga for everyone? Without a doubt. Last question, Francisco. How can our audience get in touch with you and how can we support you in your dharma? Um, I think the website is is a pretty central space, uh, synergy.yoga and you know, the, an email, you know, either that you can email through the website. Um, the Instagram is synergy dot yoga as well. And as far as support, it's, I mean, just take care of yourself. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you find that one of the offerings of synergy yoga is helpful to you, come <laughs> and enjoy it and take and use it as an instrument for self care. Um, I think that when people are able to, uh, liberate their body of pain and they can find more focus and bring more of their, their, their good energy to the circle, you know, um, at the end of the day, I think the most important thing that yoga offers is community. So take care of yourself and participate in your community and don't be afraid to ask questions that may sound weird. (laughs) Awesome. That's a, that's a great call to action to leave us with. You heard it here first, get your seat, get yourself a seat in the circle, participate, be a part of the community. 
All right, Francisco, I appreciate you so yeah. much. Thank, Thank you, you for much. taking the time to, to sit with me, to be in this virtual circle, this digital circle today. And hopefully we can rejoin up in Live in the Flesh pretty soon. Yeah, you got it. Have fun in, in L.A. And um, thank you for making the time. I'll talk to you soon. Dharma Talkers, I hope you enjoyed listening to that conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. And if you did, please share it. Take a screenshot, share it on Instagram, and tag me, at Henry Wins. I love hearing from you about the conversations that make an impact for you. We have the ability to shape the world through our thoughts, words, and conversation. So let's influence the collective consciousness together. All my gratitude to Rory Wagstaff of Ease of Mind Productions for keeping our audio crisp and operations smooth, and to Patrick Kiebzak of Momentology Music and Art for supplying the powerful soundtrack to these conversations. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review, and tune in to new episodes of Dharma Talk every Thursday. I'll speak to you next week, and until then, keep living your Dharma.